Hello and welcome to the ultimate newbie guide for Shinobi's story. I am your host, Cax Nova, and we're going to go ahead and create a brand new character to show off exactly what it is you need to know and what you need to do to succeed at this game. Step number one is to hit the randomize button until you wind up with the most freakishly horrible character. You can't really do that in this game, can you? The characters all look pretty reasonable, except there's a lot of bald hairstyles, but don't worry about that. And now that we have the most perfectest character ever, we can go ahead and hop into the game. First off, you have to select a faction. Currently, the Hidden Leaf Village is the only one available. They are currently working on the Hidden Village of Rain. All characters pictured are 18 years or older. And now that we have the most perfectest backstory ever, we can go ahead and hop into the game. You begin your adventure in the Ninja Academy. You'll want to go ahead and take the quest from Hirota Sensei. And with that introduction out of the way, we can go ahead and move to the most important part of the game, customizing your character's appearance. That can be done here at Hero. Stats are not relevant for the gear purchasable here, so go ahead and customize your character based on your desired heart color. We're gonna go ahead and stick with the classic Ninja Black, but it is important to note that this guy over here, Hito, can sell you an additional kunai for dual wielding or a two-handed weapon if you wanna go that way. It's important to know that depending on the weapon style you choose to use, that is either one-handed, dual wielding, or two-handed, you get a different bonus. So one-handed is if you wanted to play a caster-type character, you get an increased attack speed. Two-handed weapons give you a damage buff, and dual wielding gives you an attack speed bonus, I believe. But we have no money, so we're going to go ahead and move on with our starter quest. You're going to want to head and go through these first couple of quests to unlock Genin status, your first biggest buff. You can go ahead and read through this little introduction. There's a couple of books in this game that can give you bonus information. You read them by equipping them with right-click from your inventory and then right-clicking one more time on your character sheet. Just to let you know, you can open up your bag at any time with the B key or by clicking on this icon in the bottom right. And you can open up your character sheet anytime with the C key or clicking on this button here on the left. Following along the instructions in the quest log, which of course you can open with the L key, we return back to Hirota Sensei, turn in our initial quest, gain another level. Several of these introductory quests will award you with scrolls. Those will be deposited into your bag, so make sure that you open up your bag and then right click to learn the ability. Now one thing I always like to do is go into interface, action bars, and I like to turn on all of my action bars so that I can see the potential slots that abilities can show up. To get to your skill book, press the P key, and then you can click and drag abilities to your action bar from there. Abilities currently on your action bar need to be dragged off with holding down shift and then left click. If you're a WoW veteran, you probably never think to put the auto attack ability onto your action bar, but I do find it to be pretty helpful for Shinobi's story. Walking around to the back of the academy takes you to your next quest giver, Instructor Shiro. This will enable you to get your ninja movement speed. One of the core components of the Shinobi story gameplay is just the tremendous amount of mobility that you get. Part one of that mobility is Chakra Jump. Once again, we're gonna go ahead and use our scroll. I like to move my Chakra Jump up here because I don't typically use it in combat situations, but if you're a PvP player, you're definitely going to want this to be readily accessible. And then using Chakra Jump, we're going to have to ascend to the top of this building. Follow my route by coming over here to the right, hitting your head on a tree branch like a scrub and then trying again and falling off. Wonderful. All right, and then we jump, and then we, and then we jump over here, and then, yep, and then we come over here. Yeah, uh-huh, and then we jump up here, eh, and then we get stuck between the building. That's part of the strategy. And then you come over here, and then you jump up on top, and there you go, Bob's your uncle. You may notice a little bit of choppiness depending on where you are in the town and where you're looking. 
I think they might have issues with culling. So if you're looking in a direction where there's a lot of polygons, you'll notice a little bit of chugging. That's to be expected. I wouldn't worry about it too much. This is going to unlock Chakra Dash, the second component of the increased mobility of this video game. Chakra Dash, as of the time of this video, is in a pretty rough spot. They've recently made it worse to the point where I don't know how practically useful it is. The idea is that you get a temporary movement speed buff that only lasts for a couple of seconds. At this point, we can come into this library area to start quests from Yoshi Sensei. These are also a good little starter quest line. Go ahead and talk back to Shizuma. Grab the next component of Yoshi Sensei's quest. The next part of his quest line leads you to the bank. One thing to note with your chakra dash that makes it a little bit more useful is you can jump at the end of its duration to get a little bit of extra fast movement speed. This here is our bank. We can turn in for that one quest. Gaining ourselves another letter. This is great for depositing any items that you don't immediately need on your person. You'll start with the green die. I recommend tossing that into your bank for now. And if it wasn't clear, the way the ninja movement works is that you have two ch movement charges that refresh every 15 seconds. They have a duration of 30 seconds, but you'll notice when this timer gets down to 14 seconds, they refresh. So what that means is you can actually use four ninja movement abilities in rapid succession if you time it right. Taking a right immediately after you exit the front gates and then taking another right will take you to the first training ground. After reaching the first training ground, you can learn your third component of ninja movement right as soon as you learn your most basic attack ability, which is Simple Strike. You will have to re-equip your kunai after turning those quests in. We're going to go ahead and learn Simple Strike, which shows up as a general jutsu and it's automatically added to your bar so long as you have empty space. We will learn Chakra Recharge, which is a very helpful ability to have. It's a two minute cooldown that restores half of your total chakra pool for using abilities. And the last ability that we get is the Ninja Travel Speed, that third component of Ninja Movement Speed. Note that some of the abilities give you the text that you're able to cast this jutsu while moving. Unlike other World of Warcraft type experiences, this is uh, a much more highly mobile game, not just in the essence that you can move faster and jump higher, but also that you're going to be expected to be on the move throughout a lot of your combat experience. Ninja tools like this shuriken here are equipped to one of these two bottom slots in your character sheet, but note that you cannot equip it in combat, you darn snake. When you start out, you're only gonna really have access to your auto attack and simple strike. But that should be more than enough for you to take care of a couple of large snakes like these. Not ready yet. We'll go ahead and not equip the shuriken because of the wolf. Notice that these wolves are much more difficult than the snakes, and if you run into a situation where you don't think you're going to make it out alive, no worries. Just cast your substitution jutsu and get on out of there, and it will break combat and you'll be fine. Now that we can equip our shuriken, do note that these have limited charges. This one in particular has seven. That's a little bit confusing. Usually they come with ten, or at least the shuriken do but you will want to click and drag this equipment item onto your bar in order to use it like an ability. This one in particular is a ranged attack, but there are a number of other ninja tools available like antidotes and food pills to cleanse poison and restore health, respectively. Returning once more to Hirota Sensei, we'll gain another level. And then we're going to want to head our way over to the Hokage building. The Hokage building is going to be one of the easiest ones to find. It's right here in the back, closest to the mountain. The big old red building here. Now, one important thing to note is that these stairs in particular 
uh, have a reputation of trapping and slaying Genin for years to come, you'll very frequently see skeletons trapped on this stairway right about here. Do be careful, the collision in this stairway is a little bit tricky. I in fact recommend turning off Shinobi travel speed while climbing these stairs, lest you yourself get stuck here. But have no fear, if you do get stuck, you can always, in the chat, type slash unstuck to freely kill your character and get yourself out of a sticky situation. Now in order to get to the Okage, we're going to have to go up another stairwell to the top of the building. We can talk to Lord Alther Huchiha, who is, in fact, a player character. This particular character is an NPC uh, version of the player Alther Uchiha, but Alther Uchiha was elected to be Okage by the player base, which is one of the things I think that uh, Shinobi Story does really well, is that social community aspect. When we turn this quest in, we're going to get a collection of items here, and I can go ahead and take this time to talk about the progression. There are a few ways that you can progress in the game. One is character level. You'll see we're level 7 now, and our experience bar is listed down here at the bottom. That tells us how much more experience we need to gain our next level. And you'll notice that when you level up, uh, you do gain some character stats. We gain strength, lethality, stamina, ninjutsu skill, and chakra control. We only got two points per level at level 7, but every 10 levels, the amount of stats that you get per level goes up by 2. If you're curious what these stats do, here on the right side of the character page, you'll see a list of all of your stats, and you can get a more in-depth description of those stats when you highlight over them with your cursor. The second way that you can progress are with these experience boost items. These are for increasing your skill points that are visible on your skill points board, the icon second from the right. This is a particularly powerful boost at rank 4 with 150 XP in the Jutsu Power stat, so we only need 125 to gain a level of Jutsu Power. So you'll see that when I use this, we will have a message in our chat window that says our Jutsu Power is increased to level 2, and when we refresh the window, there we go, Jutsu Power is up to level 2. I do believe that each one of these levels, even though it doesn't specify, is worth 10 points in uh, the actual relevant stat. Skill points are acquired from enemies. I do believe different enemies have uh, different frequencies of drop rates for those experience boosts and for different types of skill point drops too. The third way that you can progress is with your ninja rank. So when you begin the game with a new character, we are but a lowly academy student that you can see here in our titles. But with the quest that we just turned in in this scroll here, we can achieve Genin rank, which will increase our maximum health, doubling it effectively, making us quite more powerful. There are, in fact, two ranks ahead of Genin. There's Chunin, that can be attained at a minimum of level 25, and then there is Jonin that can be attained at a minimum of level 40, I believe. But those rank ups are far and away the most significant way to progress your character's power level, but they are also the most time consuming. The final way that you can progress that I'll cover here are these Mastery Redemption Tokens. Masteries are effectively your talent trees. You can get to them with a Mastery Selection here down on the far right panel. And in the current iteration of the game, you have two categories of masteries. You've got base masteries and clan masteries. You can decide for yourself what you believe to be the most perfect mastery to fulfill your ninja fantasy. If you're into the RP part of this game, I have no judgment for you whatsoever. It can be a lot of fun. But do note that not all masteries are created equal as far as your starting mastery goes. Your starting mastery is going to be the most important one. A max level character is going to have a total of three mastery redemption tokens. You get your first at Genin, your second at Chunin, and your third at Jonin. So I would plan for your character to have a low cooldown mastery at the beginning. I think the two most popular starting masteries, if you wanted to be a caster, would be fire style, or if you wanted to be a melee character, would be swordsmanship. I recommend not selecting clan masteries for your starting mastery. These are typically better selected as your second or third mastery, 
primarily because their cooldowns are much longer and they don't typically have a complete kit in and of themselves. They have a lot more in the realm of buffs and utility. One important feature to decide your mastery is these over here on the right. So in the middle here, we have a selection of abilities, but on the right side, we have passives. You'll see that these passives are gated by level, so you have to be level 10 to earn this ability, level 30 to unlock this one, and level 50 to unlock this one. But these third passive abilities tend to have pretty significant effects, so they are worth reading ahead of time when making your decision. Like I said, ultimately when choosing your mastery, look through the abilities in the tree and take a check at their cooldowns. The shorter the total number of cooldowns, the better. Also note that the final ability in the tree is gated for level 60, and that's true regardless of which tree you're looking at. So for the majority of your beginning leveling up experience, you will be using these first six abilities in addition to the passive buff listed here at the top. Now, I already have played through as a fire character, and I've played through as a uh, taijutsu and hyuga character, so for the purposes of this video, why don't we go ahead and experiment a little bit and give lightning-style ninjutsu a try. Clicking on the top ability, we can unlock this mastery tree with our mastery redemption token. And then you'll see that we have three mastery points remaining, which will allow us to unlock the first three abilities in the tree that are automatically put onto our bar. Now, for me personally, I like to organize my ability by shortest cooldown first. So we have seven seconds, and then 12 seconds, and then 30 seconds. But it'll just take a little bit of practice to understand how these abilities fit together uh, for where you want them to be on your keyboard. Coming down to the second floor of the Hokage building, this is going to be a room you're going to need to get very familiar with because these are the daily quests that you have to do in order to earn slips. Slips are the primary way that you will progress in the game because these are what you need in order to gain the next rank. You get to be a Genin for free, but in order to become a Chunin, you need 75 C slips and 125 D slips. And then to become a Jonin, you need 100 A slips, 150 B slips, and 200 C slips. With this vendor over here, Elder Homura Utatane, you can actually trade your slips up. So for 5 Ds, you can get 1 C, and for 5 Cs, you can get 1 B, and so on. But tuning and Jonin upgrades will take a significant amount of time, so don't expect to get those very quickly. We are going to start by going through this entire list and selecting all of our D-rank quests, and we'll go ahead and accept the C-rank quest for Pelt Retrieval and the C-rank quest for Cobra Conundrum. Do note that even though Cobra Conundrum is listed as a C-rank quest, it will show up at the top of your quest log. And at the time of this video, it's still, I believe, erroneously awarding you a D-rank mission box, but it's easy to do on the way for turning in this letter for the Feudal Lord. Do make sure that before you leave the Hokage building, you talk to the innkeeper here and select Make This In Your Home. This will give you your Hearthstone item, which it says one hour cooldown. I do believe it actually has a two and a half hour cooldown. I think there might be a bug there. But this allows you to return your character to this location, which will be important later on when we are doing a certain part of our dailies. Do note that the quest for delivering a package to Yoroshi Yokohama, where did Yoroshima come from? Uh, is this item fine spider silk? So even though it's not listed as a quest item, do not sell it. I have done that many times accidentally. Now I will go ahead and show you my usual route for doing D rank quests. Starting here at the Hokage building, we can turn right and come up to this first trash bag for garbage collection. Holding shift when right clicking an item on the ground will actually automatically loot the item inside of it. Otherwise, if you just right click it, it will pull up this window and then you have to left click on it. So save yourself a minute amount of time by doing it that way.
later on, once you've purchased the milk item, which I'll show you where to buy that later, you can come into the ramen shop, talk to Old Man Rebo, and turn it in here. I don't have it yet, so we can't turn that in just yet. Then you can come around to the back side of the academy. If you're a pro gamer like myself, you can use two chakra jumps to make it to this backfield here, which is where you'll find the oversized rats and the planted vegetables. Go ahead and collect your five carrots, and then we will go ahead and deal with our 10 rats. Do note that in this cave pit thing down here to the left, you can find Shudyoku the Burrower. He's definitely worth fighting if he is available, though I am uncertain if a brand new fresh character is gonna be able to deal with him. Let's find out. His hitbox is a little bit strange, I believe because they've created this character by scaling up a very small rat character model. So depending on what abilities you have, you might not be able to hit him with any targeted abilities. You might have to rely on your auto attacks um, or area of effect abilities. Do note that when the rat leaps on top of your character, that is a moment where you can activate your targeted abilities and make this go a little bit quicker. You can also rush into the rat and force his character model to overlap with yours enough to be able to activate your targeted abilities. Fortunately, it looks like maybe we are just a little bit too weak to be able to handle him at this point. Depending on your starting mastery, you might have better luck. But it's definitely worth fighting him uh, once you are able to. Do note that your simple strike is actually an AoE, so depending on how many hits you find you are able to take, it can be worth it to find uh, groups of rats of two or three or more, depending on how much you're able to take. At the start, you might notice that you run low on health, but you can actually collect some of these apples off the ground to get a very minor restorative which won't be nearly enough to get you back up to full health, but it should be enough to at least get you through this initial rat quest. Now that we've defeated all 10 of our rats, we can move to the other corner of the village to find the lost cat, cross over this bridge here over the river, and then take the next left when you get to the front gates. On the ground here underneath this scaffolding, you'll find a wood pile. Make sure you collect that for your building supplies. There are more of them available throughout the town. I just find that's the easiest one to grab on this route. Jump yourself up to this building. Getting up on top of this little plateau here. We can then jump our way over to where the cat is, hiding behind this little box here. Turn that in to get a mission box. Go ahead and turn on your Shinobi travel speed. And then you can return the lost child to Bondo Me over here in front of the police station. And then return back to the Hokage building. Opening up your D rank boxes, you'll get both Koban and completion slips. If you're in desperate need of money, you can actually vendor these Koban. But it's much better to hold on to the Koban for bag upgrades and for your promotions. Go ahead and turn in the quests that you have so far. There is actually one more quest that we should be able to do in here. This new incredible recipe. This requires five raw pork and five chicken eggs. If you're lucky, chicken eggs can be bought from Jin, the general vendor in Kanoa. You can find him here in this building. But, as is often the case, people have purchased his chicken eggs, in which case you will have to find chickens, like over here behind the ramen shop and get lucky with their drops. Okay, these chickens seem to be afflicted with immortality, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to the second half of our beginner character daily quest run. Make sure that every two levels you gain a mastery point, so you wanna make sure that you're learning uh, your primary jutsu abilities when you can. If you want to take the safe road to Yokohama, you can follow this road straight and around. Or, if you want to be a rebel, you can understand that Yokohama is directly south of Kanoha, and you can head straight through the forest, which will be a little bit more dangerous, but through clever uses of 
chakra jumps and substitution jutsu, we should be just fine. The primary enemies that we will have to take care of on the way here are three large snakes, which will give you snake skin. And then moving south, if you find you're capable enough to handle the gray forest wolves at this point, it can be worth fighting them on the way over, which it looks like we are able to handle them now. That's good. Do note that your substitution jutsu does have a chakra cost, so it's always a good idea to make sure that you leave a little bit of chakra in reserve uh, for your substitution jutsu if you accidentally pull more enemies than you bargain for. We don't actually have uh, food items at this point. Not to worry though, because the next enemy type that we're gonna be dealing with will give us mushrooms. You can also get raw bear meat from these young black bears that you might see in the forest. Skipping past enemies until you get to a road, you'll get to the next enemy type that we need to fight, which are robbers. Robbers also have a chance to give you rice balls, which is very good, but the most important item that you're gonna be looking for are ninja pouches. At this point, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you get a minimum of four ninja pouches, but as you might notice, with this little plus button here, you can actually look at your bank. You can have up to seven more ninja pouches uh, to expand your bank slots in addition to expanding your inventory on your character. One of the things that's very important about Shinobi story that you might not be used to is the significance of food buffs. So different types of items will give you different food buffs. You'll see the mushrooms here give you a pretty weak one of 800 health and 400 chakra, but there are plenty of stronger food buffs available than this, and there are certain food buffs that stack with others. The two key ingredients that you need to know is that the raw bear meat and raw wolf meat are considered to be one spell type, and then the majority of the food that you can cook with the cooking profession is considered to be another spell type, which means that you can get two food buffs on your character at the same time, uh, eating different categories of food. There are more available later on, but it's a good idea at the beginning to make sure that you try to get at least those two food buffs at all times. Do note that for grinding purposes, AoE is king. So you probably want to be taking care of as many enemies at one time that you can handle. For one of our dailies, we're looking for these stolen tobacco shipments. We need three of them. Not even close. Oh my god. For the content, this is actually an important lesson to learn. When you die, you'll be resurrected, or not resurrected, rather you'll return as a ghost at the nearest respawn point. Do note that depending on where your character is, there is a little bit of bugginess still in the game uh, where it's common that you will return to this respawn point even if you're very far away. Uh, the penalty that you can pay for respawning at this point by talking to the spirit guide will give you five minutes of resurrection sickness, which effectively makes your character useless in combat for five minutes. So if you expect that running back to your body will take you longer than five minutes, then it can be easier just to accept the resurrection sickness and be on your way. For the sake of the video, I will go ahead and walk back to my body. Normally, you are unable to see the location of your corpse because the mini-map has been turned into a compass and the overworld map does not show your character's position, but there's a little bit of a hack where you can hover your cursor over the edges of the compass to see the direction of where the spirit, healer, spirit healer is for resurrecting like we just saw with the resurrection section, but also for where your corpse was. All right, we were somewhere around here. We've made it back to the bandit road. And when you get close enough to your body, you'll be given the prompt to go ahead and resurrect. This will undo whatever food buffs you had active. And we can go ahead and actually equip this small wooden hammer and the steel kunai. Do note that even though the steel kunai is listed as a main hand weapon, it can actually be equipped in either your main hand or your off hand, unlike the hammer, which actually needs to be required to be equipped in your main hand. That will give us the dual wielding bonus, which gives us a 10% attack speed buff, which I believe is gonna be more useful for our lightning style character than the jutsu cast time.
do know that enemy level is both less and more relevant in Shinobi Story than your typical WoW experience. Unlike a typical WoW experience, even though an enemy's level is listed as gray because they are lower level than you, they still award you their full experience value. So it can be very valuable to come back and fight larger groups of lower level enemies uh, for gaining more experience more quickly uh, than typically fighting smaller groups of higher level enemies. That'll get us our third ninja pouch and our third tobacco shipment. Once you've collected all four of your ninja pouches and all three of your tobacco shipments, having killed a minimum of eight robbers for your dailies, head back to the road and continue on your way south. I know I'm cheating myself of a ninja pouch, but for the sake of the video, let's keep things moving along. There's a little Kanoa outpost over there on the left. There are a couple of quests there that I don't think have a tremendous amount of value. So go ahead and continue past that. And you will notice that there's a fork in the road that leads up to the Akamichi restaurant. If you are interested in the cooking profession, there are a few dailies you can turn in for a pretty good amount of experience. And there is a vendor that will teach you many recipes. Uh, if you want to learn the cooking profession, you can buy the skill book from any general vendor. Now that we can make it our way down to Yokohama, we can turn in our two quests here. The first is in this building here on the right with Weaver Key. And the second is in this building here on the left for Samuro's Bodyguard. Make sure you open up all of your Koban, and you can stop by here at this vendor to clear out your inventory of anything that you don't need. Do note that those bandits have the chance to drop you a headband with stats, and it's definitely worth equipping one with relevant stats for your character's abilities. Also note that this gold Koban merchant is available in any of the towns in the game, and this is the guy that you can use to upgrade your pouches. Until all of your pouches are upgraded, this is the best use of your Koban. It takes 35 Koban to double the inventory bonus of a single pouch, and you can do that not just for the ninja pouches that you equip to your character, but you can also do it for the ninja pouches that you equip to your bank. One other important component about Yokohama is you'll notice off here to the side is a collection of a few farm animals. The sheeps are pretty tough to de deal with and I don't believe they have anything of value, but the chickens here are a great source of eggs and the pigs are a great source of pork. Unfortunately, these chickens seem to also be afflicted with a case of immortality, uh, but we can at least deal with the pigs, and you'll just have to take my word for it with the chickens. The game might crash sometimes. Uh, that's perfectly normal. From here, we can go ahead and start taking the long journey to the capital of the country, where you turn in your letter for the feudal lord, this is quite a bit of a walk, and it can be a little bit dangerous, so do take that into mind. I don't typically do this quest in particular every single day, uh, but I do do it on the days that I need to go buy milk and vegetables. When you reach the southern land of fire, it might be a good idea to cut this corner here to the left, because along this road are some more difficult bandit enemy types that might not take too kind. Oh god, I found one of them. Leave me alone! Continue following this road east until you reach a bridge, and then know that once you've reached this bridge, the quest Cobra Conundrum can be completed just north of your position by defeating these little cobra hatchlings here. Unfortunately, I lack the range to be able to defeat them without aggroing these big pappy snakes at this point, so I can't do it, but if you are a fire character, you might have better luck at it than I will. Do watch out for the crocodiles close to the water, and then continue along eastward following the road, keeping care not to get too close to enemies, until we reach Nachi City. 
And all right, at this fork in the road, we've reached Nachi City. We can go ahead and take a left to turn in our letter for the feudal lord. Also note that if you're into cooking, this guy here will sell you a recipe for grilled chicken. Head back and to the right through this pretty fanciful looking archway. Once again, to the right into the palace. And then of course, new players like us are not permitted to approach the feudal lord himself, so we have to do our business through his liaison. And with that daily completed, we can go ahead and continue along the path to where you purchase milk and vegetables. Take a left once you get out of Nachi City, until you get back to the road. You'll notice here an abundance of heavy ox, which is in fact one of the C rank quests. I did not pick it up because it is quite difficult as far as C rank quests go. You'll start to notice that with the C rank enemies, combat gets to be a little bit more tactical. These oxes actually do not move very much, but they start to have area of effect attacks. One of their attacks will hit a cone in front of them, and one of their attacks will hit a large area around them. So if you are a caster, you will have a much easier time dealing with these oxes than if you are a melee character. One thing to note is that this game is populated with world bosses, one of which is Uregani over here on the beach. This crab is special because he is one of the easiest or fewest bosses that drops sea slips, uh, but all of the world bosses will drop a slip type that corresponds to their power level, and it's not uncommon for players to spend extraordinary amounts of time waiting for bosses to respawn, usually about 15 minutes, uh, to kill them over and over again to try and get to the next rank, Chunin and Jonin, uh, as quickly as possible. But I only recommend considering that if you have already completed your allotment of dailies for the day and you have an abundance of free time on your hand. You'll notice I'm taking a left off the road to come over here to this cow farm. Hiroe over here is going to sell you bowl of cold milk. Normally I wouldn't recommend vendoring Koban, but just to get ourselves a little bit of starting cash, I'm going to go ahead and pick up a couple stacks of cold milk. Jumping over this wall, we can enter into Tiller Town, where we will find Farmer Koharu, the vendor for these crates of vegetable. Thankfully, these are much cheaper, but not thankfully, they do not stack. So it can be worth it to buy a whole bunch of these and then stick them into your bank so that each day you don't have to make the trip all the way back over here. You can just withdraw one from your bank and turn it in immediately. Now, before we head back, there is one other key component of this town, other than the abundance of cabbage, which can be a pretty decent free food item, and that is this selection of wheat. You may come across some cooking recipes that require wheat, like noodles for one of the cooking dailies, and in order to make noodles, you need flour, and the way that you get flour is by taking that wheat over to this lady here, Yaku, and turning it in for bundles of flour. Finally, we have discovered some chickens that are actually capable of death. This can be another good place to get lucky at collecting some chicken eggs. But otherwise, once you've concluded your business here, I'm going to go ahead and use my reverse teleportation scroll to return to Kanoa. Once you're back in the Hokage building, you can go ahead and turn in the leftover dailies that you have, grab your boxes, and deposit any leftover items in the bank. There are a few more starter quests that you can do from Shizuma here. Once you become a Genin, and important to note that in that quest line, you will need to speak with Jiraiyu, and Jirayu is listed in the quest description as being found in the hot springs, but that is not true. The place that you need to find him is actually 
up on top of these buildings over here, overlooking the hot springs. Doing Jiraiya's quest line will grant you a free stack of 500 bones. Bones are an important item in this game. You get them from just about, if not every single enemy that you defeat, and every town has its own special, unique bone buff. Konoha's bone buff can be received from Hirozimi Senju here, and it gives you the Will of Fire. What a bone buff does is it's a two-hour buff that persists through death, and you can only have one at a time. For new players, I recommend not worrying about what the other town bone buffs are, and using uh, Hirumi's here when you expect to be fighting a lot of enemies, because this gives you a bonus of 2,000 to your maximum health, and a 15% bonus to your XP acquired. There are three more things that I want to cover in this video. The first is War Mode. Talking to Captain Kanjiku, you can enable War Mode, which will increase your damage done, healing received, and experience gained, which is an incredibly significant bonus, but this also turns on World PvP. For the most part, players are pretty friendly to new characters, but that's not always the case. Um, and, in general, Shinobi Story is a very social game, but do note that there can be drama, and when you align yourself with one player faction, that uh, might make yourself the enemy of other player factions. So do be careful. Uh, don't be too hasty to join up with an organization before you understand what you're getting yourself into. Otherwise, the last two things that I want to show you First is water walking, which you can get to over on this side of the map. Also note these little glowy sparkly things. You can uh, open secret chests with these if you get the right kind of revealing scroll. Sometimes you'll find them in your quest boxes. Heading northwest out of Konoha and west of the great Hokage Lake you will stumble upon a collection of pillars. This is where you can learn water walking. Come talk to Zandaka-sensei to get the quest. And watch carefully while I show you the perfect way to complete this quest every time. Head on over to this pillar here. Angle yourself in this direction. Nobody saw that. That I, I hit it every time. First, all right, you ready? You just jump and jump. First try, not even close. And then turning back to the pillar that we just jumped from, you will jump up and back and then chakra jump and voila. Gets us up to level 10 and teaches us the water walking jutsu. At early levels, this can be a pretty significant drain on your chakra total, but later on, uh, the amount of chakra cost is going to be inconsequential, and it can be a good idea just to leave that on so you don't forget about it. Then we're going to go ahead and head back to the road in the direction of Konoha. And then taking a left, leaving Kanoha, you can follow this road to the east. That will lead you to the second training ground with Guy Sensei. Guy Sensei will give you a quest for the Forgotten Lunch. Watch carefully as I can show you my route up the mountain. Do note that from... Uh, traditional WoW experiences, you have a much easier time climbing vertical surfaces. In fact, a lot easier than most typical video game experiences. But that doesn't mean that you can climb up sheer cliff faces. There are still limits to your abilities. Not even close. Uh, that was, that wasn't even a close one. I had that in the bag all the way. 
climbing up to this part of the mountain, you can find the Forgotten Lunch. And if you're a pro Genji like myself, you can jump yourself right back off the mountain using your second chakra jump right before you hit the ground uh, to make sure that you mitigate your fall damage. And then we can go ahead and turn in Master Guy's lunch. And he will give us the scroll for the breakfall technique. This is not going to add an ability to my bar. It is, in fact, a passive listed here that says reduces damage from falling by 50%. Pay no heed to the requires level 40. This is active as soon as you learn it, and it requires no activation. It effectively turns off fall damage. You're not immune to it, but uh, it's quite nice to have. I definitely recommend picking this up as early as you are able. But all right, guys, that's going to do it for me and for this guide. I think with the information in here, you should be well on your way. Definitely, uh, in terms of prioritizing your progression, focus on getting as many dailies done each day that you can to try and get as many slips to get towards that tuning upgrade. And if you've completed all of the dailies that you can do in a day, then it can be worth heading out into the forest and doing a little bit of grinding to get those extra stat points from leveling up. Otherwise, if there's anything in here that I did not cover, make sure you follow me over on twitch.tv slash caxnova, where I'll be playing lots of Shinobi Story and also working on some of my own game dev projects. I'm currently working on Meticulous, a gamified personal health companion that will help you automate your diet and fitness planning. If you're interested in something like that, make sure you head down to my Discord link in the description. Otherwise, thanks for checking out the video and have a great rest of your day. Peace.